Hello everybody, welcome to Rocket Lasso Live, episode 13. This episode is going to be a little bit different in that I am making it so that nobody can post a link today. Everybody has to type out a question and we're going to tackle it that way. It's just an experiment for fun, we'll see how that goes. We've already got some questions popping up in the chat, so let's go ahead and switch our screen over to cinema so I don't forget to do it after the question and start reading some questions. We might jump around a little bit, but Mr. Matt Dog had a Dynamics question. I love Dynamics questions, so I'm going to take a look at that one first. Um, Let's see, specifically, I'd love to understand how to give objects different weights. Like a, oh, like the difference of maybe a shoebox and a gold brick would behave differently. Yeah, and it, yeah, there's a mass tab, but you don't understand how it works. Um, yeah, and then specifically, why can't I just enter a weight in pounds or kilograms? Uh, fair question. I have actually never tackled it on a kind of mathematical level. It's always just been... Uh, eyeballing it, making something heavier if it needs to be. So let's go and do a couple quick tests along those lines. Let's make ourselves a little testing scene here. So I'm thinking let's make a floor. I'm going to make this cube. Let's move this cube up 100 units. Let's go ahead and turn on a little bit of SSAO so we can see some contact points. Maybe make the floor white. Let's go ahead and make a copy of the cube. Make this cube editable. I'm going to select this top polygon, T for scale. Scale this down to zero, holding shift. And I'm going to go... Select all, and then I'm going to right-click and say Optimize. I always forget the shortcut for that one. Uh, shortcut is UO. So there we go. This should be optimized now. And now we can grab this second cube I made, and we'll pull this one up into the air. Let's go ahead and make this one nice and skinny and long. So we got our little teeter-totter going here. And let's see if we can drop some weights on one side or the other. So let's go ahead and make a material. That one is really big for some reason. Let's go ahead and make a nice little brown color for a little bit of this wood here and let's go ahead and drop some different weight things so we're going to, have to make everything dynamic uh, i'm going to grab the floor and the little triangle pedestal thing and make it a dynamic collider body and let's go ahead and add onto the cube a regular rigid body cool now actually your examples were pretty good i like those so let's go ahead and make a little shoebox here, which I'm going to do as simple as possible, which is going to be make this editable and hit I for inner extrude and D for extrude right there. Boom. That's our shoebox. And then, so we'll scoot this over here and let's go ahead and make another one. And this one will be our block of gold. That This one's going to be visually tinier. And obviously we're just kind of making up these proportions make that editable so we can go and obviously do a little taper in on the top otherwise it's not a gold bar let's go ahead and make it fun we'll go and do the color on it in fact if we put an HDR then you can do the all the color in reflectance which is kind of fun but I don't think we should worry that much about it let's just go and make it uh, specular based we'll make it Nice and shiny. Not exactly fancy, but it's something. Let's make that a little bit more yellow. All right, so there we go. Let's go ahead and make sure we name these gold. We'll name this one Shoebox, just so we don't mix, mix those up. And let's go ahead and I'm going to rename this Plank. Base. Just keep things organized. Why not? And then we'll make both of these dynamic simulation rigid body. Of course, you have to rem always remember that dynamic calculations uh, always make changes to your scene at the time of zero. Otherwise, uh, they will not move. If we are any frames forward, it wouldn't move at all. So I'm going to go ahead and put these both pretty close to the surface. They can go and fall a little bit. So with them being dynamic right now, and even the distance that they've traveled is going to be a variable as well. Like that should be as far over as the uh, shoebox is visually, approximately. So let's go ahead and hit play and see what we get. Well, first, right away, you see that this box is a larger object. So it is heavier. Let's go ahead and give ourselves some more frames. And uh, let's go ahead and do a couple extra things as well. I'm going to grab all three of our dynamic objects. And let's go ahead and say that they are... Um, friction. Oh, uh, I'm going to get rid of all the bounce and let's add in a decent amount of friction. 
So now it shouldn't. Uh, so now if it's getting flung up in the air, it's because of the counterweight. So obviously, box wins heavier. Now, something I'm curious about right off the out of the gate is: is this box heavier because of its bounding box or because of? Well, I guess the point of the question is: if we change our shape from automatic, which is going to be generating just a big box around it, change that from automatic to a moving mesh, now it should just be kind of calculating these thin walls around the edge. Does that make the box lighter, or is it calculating just based on the overall bounding box? So if we hit play, it well, it did make it lighter. That bo that block of gold did not go flying up in the air, but it's still a lot heavier. So let's go into what's going to be our main parameter here, and that's going to be our density. So all we're doing is calculating density. Now, what density is going to do is how dense is the object, and my assumption would be it's doing a calculation on what is the volume of an object, and based on the volume of the object, it's then multiplying it by its density. So it should be pure... Like, I mean, that's what you'd want to do, is like, okay, this is made of a standard density, and based on the size, it's going to have a particular weight. So it's world density, so it's just like this universal one, but you can go and uh, swap it to custom density. In fact, let's do that in both of them. If we're on custom density, then I think nothing should change. It's the exact same weight. We should see it do a little hop into the air as well. That's really straightforward. Now, where and now so but we've also got mass, and to tell you the truth, I have no idea the difference between density and mass in cinema. Let's go ahead and change it both to a custom mass and see if anything changes. Oh, look at that. Interesting. Um, we changed it both to mass and immediately this block of gold start is was heavier. Why would that be? Like we're changing both of them. So they both have a custom mass of 10 and suddenly the gold became heavier. That's super interesting. So um, what we should do is just take a quick gander over at what the short description of mass is. Uh, mass, if you want to define the mass as independent of the volume of the object. So you're just straight up applying a, a set weight to it instead of it doing the volume. And then this just says desired des density. And it's, I mean, yeah, unfortunately, it's not giving us any additional information than that. So let's see, by default, center of mass. Yeah, we don't want to worry about that. Yeah, so it's actually really straightforward. If you set it to mass, you are directly setting the total weight. If you set it to density, then the bigger your object, the more it's going to weigh. So along those lines, it would be, yeah, if we wanted to just be like, oh, you know, we don't care about the size of these. I just want to set a direct mass. Now, the of course, the unfortunate thing is cinema doesn't have a, a unit of, of weight, but I think everything here is just going to be relative. So I think if you did want to treat this like pounds, so let's go ahead and let's see uh, how much does a bar of gold weigh? There you go. Uh, it's 14 kilograms. We'll just use that as our measurement. And I'm going to put that in here. So we'll just say, well, got to get rid of our kilograms. But let's just say it's 12. And now we can grab our shoebox. And I have no idea what a shoebox weighs. And I, I don't know kilograms, but let's just say it's 0.5. So it's 0.5 if our unit is kilograms. And we could build our own relative weight scale, which is like, okay, this block of gold weighs this amount. That's our unit of measurement. And now if we hit play, then obviously that should be way heavier. And it should go ahead and fling our box. So along these lines, like, yes, you kind of would wish you could type in pounds. But along those lines, you kind of get your wish automatically. Because... Um, I don't know what kilograms is in pounds. Um, let's see. Let's just say this in kilograms. The point here, yeah, kilograms to pounds. So it's 27 pounds. But here's the point is this is just relative. So if we put in for the gold bar a custom mass of 23 or 27, and over here we just type in still whatever we want, let's say 25, uh, if that was accurate to what that shoebox would weigh, all that matters is the relative nature between them. So just be consistent in any given scene file, and it should work. So go ahead and just type it in as if it's pounds, and that should work. Now, when it comes to the, the density, then... Um, 
let's see. Yeah, when it comes to density, you got to keep in mind that's going to be calculating the volume. So if you're trying to be kind of precise, I almost feel like you are going to be better off switching it over to mass. I was always kind of curious about how that would, how that would actually apply. So yeah, the fact that this is, you can think of it as absolute and relative to the size of the object. So that's pretty cool. So yeah, our nice little test here, I think is a fine little testing protocol and you want to put on the different properties of the object. You know, even, even with fun things where it's like, okay, you know, even the shoebox should probably be a little bit aerodynamic. So we could put in, I'm not sure, little amounts go a long way, but we can go and put a little bit of drag and a little bit of lift and that should stop that from bouncing so high up in the air because kind of the air is slowing it down. So you see that stops it from being flung up, but then this wouldn't really have much in the way of air resistance, not that this is heavy, but if we suddenly told the box, once again, it being relative, let's say that this box is made of lead now, you just go to our mass and we'll say, actually, the weight of this is now 55 pounds. That's going to be heavier than the gold. And now I can fling the gold up in a very solid way. So yeah, I would say that that is the answer to the basics of the weight question here is just keep it, uh, keep it relative to whatever unit you want it to be. Scene files. This is going to be number 1A. Mm, weights, density, mass. All right, back to the chat. Hi, everybody. There's something wrong with the bar of gold. What was wrong with the bar of gold? Mm, mm, mm. I'm going to scroll back up to go some of the questions that were there earlier. Um, hmm. I'm going to read a few questions. Sean is asking about trying to do the best possible realistic glass breaking, which is definitely a possibility. Um, is there a way to map a texture onto a plane's UVs and then project that texture onto geometry? using changes made on the geometries UVs. Map it to a plane's UVs, then project that texture onto geometry using changes made to the geometries UVWs. Um, interesting question. Nothing that is super immediately coming to mind. My assumption here would be that you, something interesting is popping into my head, which might not at all do what you want it to do. But a lot of people, I barely tinker with it. I don't think a lot of people use it in cinema. And it's entirely possible there might be some fancy thing you do with Expresso, definitely with code. But let me see if I can cover the question correctly. The basic idea being if we make a plane, and we're going to leave these polygon subdivisions on. Let's go ahead and make a material. And just so we can see the patterning, I'm going to keep it simple. And let's go ahead and just put a checkerboard on here. So let's go ahead and find the old checkerboard. And let's go ahead and tile it 10 by 10. And we will apply it. So cool. This is now UVW. We can make that editable. And if we modify the UVs or if we modify the geometry, then obviously this will distort. Because when you distort the geometry, you're distorting the UVs. So if we were to view this from the top, let's... I guess we can actually see it. If we were to go and grab the magnet tool, shortcut MI, then I should be able to start dragging this. And you see, we're going to start distorting our pattern. Now, the question comes in, can we uh, project that onto another piece of geometry? And the basic, I'm trying to think if there's even a very manual way. And I would want to come up with a dynamic way, but if there's a very manual way. But even that, I'm a little... I'm a little stumped because UV is ultimately the main one. But so here, here's what I'm th I can only think of a workaround right now. And that is, let's go ahead and make a more complicated piece of geometry. I'll grab a landscape and we'll push this down. In fact, we can kind of have it in a completely, yeah, we can move it way down. Essentially unrelated. Let's go ahead and make it nice and tall. And 
and let's not border at sea level. Cool. So we got this big complicated piece of geometry. So you want to make a, modif a simple modification up here based on modifying the UVs or the visual simple version is MI using this tool, using the magnet tool where you could go and warp this stuff and have it modify the material down here. So I can't immediately think of a way of doing that. But if we were to make another material and in our in our color channel, if we go and use the, I don't even know where it is. I use this so infrequently. Camera shader. How often do you use a camera shader? So this camera shader wants a camera. So let's just make a camera. We're going to drag it in there. And I'm not so sure about these scales, but let's go ahead and go to the POV of this camera. And let's spin around to the top here. And let's go and mathematically make this camera projection very even. So I'm going to say 0, 0, 0 rotation, and negative 90 rotation on P. And I'm not sure exactly how we need to frame this up. I'm going to zoom way up here, so it's kind of framing top and bottom. And now we can... <sighs> Excuse me. Okay, so that's now projecting, and now we've got this projection camera. Let's go ahead and apply this material to our plane. And now it's being applied to the the UV project projection of that plane, which is fine. We also do a flat projection, I think would also work. Now, of course, the problem here is we are not going to see the preview. We are not going to get a preview of this. But I think if we hit render, yeah, if we hit render, we will see it. So that's, a that's the trade-off. We can't see it in the viewport. Of course, you could turn on your interactive render region, maybe put the lowest possible setting. And yeah, we can be getting some sort of feedback really quickly on it. I guess we're so simple it doesn't be that low. Excuse me. But yet, yeah, we can now see that we are projecting that material onto this one. Now, the uh, height of this landscape is going to get a little difficult to see, so let's go ahead and simplify that a little bit. Hit N, or let's see what's a good display mode. I don't want to say no textures because we're going to lose everything. But it's just rendering out black on everything, even in the preview. We're seeing it. Um, oh, that's cool. You can not include the foreground and background. And unfortunately, you can see that, look, we are seeing a little bit of a preview here, but it's not interactive. It doesn't update. Uh, you probably set that something like a plane. But even the way this is showing up, like, I don't know. It's kind of weird. It seems to be doing a spherical thing. Oh, actually, notice there seems to be a preview, and there's a light there. Is that the way their scene is set up? There's a little light there? Hmm, it's kind of interesting. Well, it's like, oh, it's like this camera's projecting in their little scene there. That's not relative to what this is doing, is it? Oh, okay. Nope, I didn't do that properly. Uh, move. Rotate. Oh, no. I, that would have been interesting. If this camera, like, it's kind of like the little virtual mini window was linked to this camera that we had, but it's not. It's just relative. But now, yeah, we are seeing the scene from above the top view, and you can see the scene that we see our previewed images in, which is kind of interesting. Never noticed that before. But yeah, in any case, if we hit render, you can now see that this only has our projected material on it. And you see we have these really nice UVs projected directly down onto it. Although, it seems to be... Um, the aspect ratio seems odd, which probably means I don't use, the, like I said, I don't use the camera object too often. But my assumption here is that it's based on our render setting. So if I, you see how it's rectangular here? So if I hit command or command B... We can go to our output, and then let's just make it uh, square looking. And if we render, I imagine that will look square now. Oh, it's not. Interesting. So our camera is our camera. Yeah, our camera set up to be square now. So why is that image projecting not square? That's unusual. Now, I was going to say there's probably multiple ways to fix that, because it go inside here, not in there, uh, going inside the camera mapping then we have our horizontal scale and our vertical scale, but they're both set to 100. Our camera is square. Everything is zeroed out. So I'm a little confused as to why that would be the case. Now we do see here that those lines are not perfectly matching the edge. So we probably want to grab our camera and pull it down further until, boop, right? This little line is connecting right in the end. I'm just eyeballing it, but you could probably pretty mathematically accurately put that there or maybe set it to a parallel camera. I'm not sure that would work, but uh, why? Oh, well, that's, well, it seems to have scaled the whole thing up, but it's still rectangular. Is my landscape 
and my landscape is is square. So yeah, I'm like I tell you, I'm not entirely sure why that's the case. Now, just to make it clear, this this object can go anywhere. I could scoot this over here, and it's being having the material projected directly down. I just don't have it scaled in any way, so that's still throwing me off. And that's square. And the render settings are square. Double check that, but I'm pretty sure they are. Yeah, I'm not sure why that becomes rectangular. Unless it's bet dependent on the viewport at any given moment. Oh my god, it is. Okay, well, I figured out what was happening, but that's unfortunate. Is It's being determined by the physical window that we have here. So if I stretch this window really wide, that's going to be more stretched. And if it's less, then it's going to be less. So that's a little untrustworthy there, i got to say. But when you render out your final, it's going to be treated as square. But at least we figured out why. Now, in any case, I'm going to go, and just for the example now, if we were to go to our plane and distort it somehow, in fact, we can do it procedurally if we wanted. Let's go and grab a displacement. And let's go and put a nice noise shader in there. And let's have it distort on a plane, and the plane will be X+. plus. Let's go ahead and have it distort quite a bit. But we need to scale it up. So let's make it 500. Mm, 1,000. Okay, there. Now we're getting some nice distortion there, and I usually would make a second one of these. And we will set it to Z+, plus, and now we're getting distortion on two different angles. And I'd also like to put a different seed in there. There we go. So we get all this distortion. And now with that being distorted, when we render, we're going to get that distorted material projecting down onto our object. So a little bit of a workaround, but you know, there's potentially some pretty interesting things you could do there. Now, having said that, in the new nodes, in the new node-based materials in physical in R20, you can manipulate the UVs. So you could actually put a distorter in the UV channel itself and distort that and maybe do this in a more direct way. The problem is that not many people are using the physical renderer anymore and um, yeah, people aren't using the physical renderer that much and you can't implement nodes into into a displacer or into most things right now so it really makes it limited for the reasons you would use it isn't that fun oh i guess this plane does have height but isn't it funky how it seems to project this extra like sense of height like there's a little valley there there's some height here but that is not what's going on um and yeah it's just based on the uv so yeah pretty interesting kind of a fun little mechanical thing for us to have tinkered with there so thanks for that question it was neat Distort it. Yeah, let's go ahead and give that one a quick save and we'll jump to another question. Do, 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 do. What am I doing? Sorry, if, if there's. I'm getting distracted by some noises somewhere else, so it's making my brain go in the wrong place. Um, oh, yeah, this is camera projection. Camera projection. Okay, cool. Back to the chat. Okay, scrolling down. Everybody's been typing up some more fun stuff down here. I don't want to find fall too far behind in the chat because maybe somebody is saying, saying that something's wrong or maybe I'm not doing something. Do, 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 do. Oh, okay. Uh, Optimus Prime uh, is exactly what you're looking for. So I, that is very good to hear. Um, um, is there a way to emulate the camera shader in Redshift? Uh, no idea. Mm, absolutely no idea if there's an equivalent of a camera shader. I mean, what, what ends up happening is there is a lot of... There's a lot of really specific shaders inside of Cinema 4D that are not going to exist inside of the third-party renderers, like all the funky, fancy ones. Yeah, one, you know, I, I keep on needing to do things with Proximal, and it doesn't seem to work in, in the third-party renderers as a general rule. <laughs> Sphere Factory... How would you create a realistic looking coastline around an island where you have lots of visible rocks and seaweed, but underwater and they gradually fade to teal, then blue? 
with a reef detail that becomes visible at a certain point. Uh, how much time do you think we have here at Sphere Factory? Um, having said that, well, if you're in vanilla cinema, there's only so many things you can do. Um, so uh, we're going to make the quickest possible version of what you're describing here. Uh, some coral would be the comp most complicated. I mean, the coral, I guess coral is specific, but this is a good excuse to use some cool, fun, fast uh, noise-based volume. So let's make a volume builder, immediately make a volume mesher, put that inside. Let's go ahead and create a noise-based one. So let's go ahead and create a uh, create menu field menu shader field menu put that in here and let's go ahead and make a noise and yep cool we get our nice noise right away let's go ahead and set it to something that seems a little more corally uh, once again you can't beat Naki we're gonna put Naki in there let's go ahead and make it pretty big and we're gonna make our uh, we're feeding in the shader field into our volume builder, and you see it is giving it a defined shape. So a box is fine. Let's go ahead and make it a lot wider. Uh, that's fine. And now we'll go into our shader field. I'm going to put this into a colorizer. Inside the colorizer, we can go from black to white, and then back to black again, making these changes while that is turned on. is definitely slowing it down. I'm going to say distribute knots, which is going to sp spread them all out. Um, so that's all good, and I think what we need to do now is pinch these in. It might actually be the opposite that I need, which is white to black. White. Come on. Hup. White to black to white. Yes, no? Uh, no, it looked like I was right the first time, sorry. So, okay, cool, we got that. Now we don't have that much detail, so let's go ahead and decrease our size. That should crank up that detail. And now the tighter that I pinch these two in, the thinner these lines should be. So, you know, that's just an excuse for showing off the noise on there. So we can turn on a volume measure, and that's just fun to do. In our volume measure, we could, you know, as we increase the detail, it should be able to handle more, more detailed. I guess loosely, loosely using the uh, the term coral here. Let's go into our noise and make it a little more vertical. Five hundred. So it's going to stretch it up. Definitely not coral, but I like it. And I'm pretty sure we could put, yeah, we could put a smoothing node in here. It's going to smooth it way out. Smoothing is a pretty blunt instrument, though, so we're going to go easy on it. And I'm pretty sure we can make our shader field bigger. Volume builder, it should calculate much wider. Dare we? No, I'll do 400. Let that calculate our in our volume measure. We can make it adaptive because you know for my final render, I'm fine with that being very low poly. It still takes a little while to calculate, but there we go. So now let's say we're building our island once again. We're going to make lots of use of our landscape object. So let's go ahead and say that we're making our island. Boom, there's our island, T for scale. Make this sucker pretty big. There's our island. Like that. Might need to change up the way our coral's working, but we'll be pretty zoomed in. And we need a shore. So a couple different things we might do here. So I'm going to make a cube, actually, to be our volume of water. I'm going to make it 2,000 tall. Let's subtract it, minus 1,000. So now it's laying flat on the ground, and then we're going to make it really big. So it's kind of like a floor, but it's actually a volume that goes pretty deep. And along those lines, we can are now free to go and do something like drop that down and under the surface of the water. And your coral, you were saying, was down further. We can grab our island. Let's go into our wireframe, because we're actually supposed to be seeing underneath this. Or we can grab our cube and put a display tag and put on use. Let's go ahead and turn on lines. Okay, so we're seeing through there, we can see our coral. And you know what, I'm gonna, I wanna be able to manipulate that more, so I'm going to make this editable. And now it should be really easy for us to take this and hit T, uh, T for scale, we'll make it bigger, we'll make it go down and hit T for scale, scale it up vertically. I might even make a copy of it and we'll make this one really wide. So we'll do something like that. There we go, just get a little bit of funky extra underwater terrain going. Just having some quick fun with it. 
I always I always like where it's like when people are building video game maps. You ever walk watch like the it was a Quixel videos where people are building maps and you just make one piece of one object and you start manually placing it around and you can kind of artistically start designing things where you start getting those more detailed things. So it's like, okay, our detailed area is right here, but then you get more and more and more as it goes further and further out. It's always fun. And then why not? Let's do some quick ribbons. In fact, um, I think the best thing we might be able to do would be, I'm just going to make a plane, T for scale, and we're going to make our seaweed. Why don't, just do, why don't we just use hair? Also, we should probably make a floor here. This is unrelated. I'm going to do that. I'm going to make a copy of that T for scale. We're going to make that one really big so the island fades into something. And now this one will be our hair. Floor. This plane will be hair. Uh, I, we, I guess we don't need too many hair, so I can make it bigger. And let's add a simulation. Hair, add hair. And let's make our hair pretty long. I'm not sure how far, so let's just eyeball that like that. We're going to vary the length, so we'll go easy on it. I'm going to go ahead and say, yes, see. I'm going to say I want the editor to see the final hair lines. So I'm going to go ahead and let's show all of them. We don't need too many. Let's say a 1,000. Yeah, a 1,000 might be too many, but it's fine for now. Let's go into our hair. If we're making seaweed, we probably just go. be a really, really, really good idea to pull up some reference, but we're just trying to do this quick. So we'll just call that our seaweed. I'm going to get rid of the specular. And thickness is going to be super important here. Let's go ahead and add um, pretty big thickness. I guess we can have it fade out on the end. And we can go to color. We'll add a little bit of variation, variation, variation. And scale variation. Definitely an important one. We'll do 55% variation. Does that push them up as well? Yeah, it does. I wasn't sure if it pushed them up as well as down. So now we do need to go back into our guides and we'll pull the length down so we're never going to be, I don't want them ever shooting above the surface of the water. There we go. Uh, and, and I forgot one of the most important things, we need to make them wavy. So we can do frizz, we could do displacement, twisting. There's a lot of different ones we could do here, uh, but there's a wave one. We don't use wave very often because we don't have an excuse to. I'm not sure if that will work, but let's go into our hairs. 24 segments, so we can really subdivide them. And yeah, look at this nice little waviness. Working pretty well. Increase that. Yeah, look at that. Pretty nice. So, okay, cool. We've got our, you know, kind of geometry elements. Let's give it a save before I mess something up. And, uh, I don't know. I'm just going to call it. Well, I guess it's not wave. It's more of... Uh, Undersea. Alrighty. Um, let's go ahead and uh, start tinkering around. First thing we would probably be a good idea would be to get some sort of lighting going. So I guess it would probably be a good idea to use an HDR. Yeah, let's use a sky. I'd kind of like a, a just, I'd like to make the sun with an object and the sky with an HDR. I don't think that any of the Grayscale Gorilla ones actually do that for us. But it will give us reflections at least. So let's go ahead and I'm going to create the sky. Let's create a material. We're going to use Link for this. and But you can just feed in HDR. But I'm going to grab my color channel. And let's right click. And we're going to add a HDR link. And I want to control this texture. And now I can launch the browser. And let's go to skies and I'm gonna grab something that's not the most intense of suns that one will work there we go so now we've got uh, we've got a sky that's gonna be portraying some sort of sun at least and let's go ahead and create a actual light that will be our real sun let's go ahead and create a infinite light we're going to point it approximately from the direction of the other one Let's go ahead and pull that off. It's an infinite light, so the distance doesn't even... I, I could leave it right here in the middle, and that's actually completely fine. And in theory, that should be a a uh, hard light. I guess it goes fades out. Yeah, it depends on what the sun is doing. We'll just say a hard light for now. And we need to add in some render settings. So let's do some quick 
uh, physical render. Um, I'm going to say we're going to go real low on this. We can, I like lowering these all down really far and then going into the adaptive and saying to progressive and just letting go more, you know, better and better and better. So that's pretty, that's better for our live streaming purposes. And we need GI. So let's go ahead and right click and say global illumination. These are once again, settings that I am, don't pay too much attention to because I don't render that often. I think usually we go QMC first but I don't remember. Gamma samples. I'm gonna lower lots of things down. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, okay, so. I don't know what that will, how long that will take to render. Let's see. Oh, that's not bad. It's not necessarily a render setting I wanted, but it rendered pretty quick. So now we need to set up some sort of a water for ourselves. So let's go ahead to our cube. Oops, I just dropped that completely randomly. We're going to go to our cube. Let's pull this up into the air. And uh, we got some old recipes we could do for creating nice looking water. Get rid of color entirely. Let's turn on transparency. Let's make it water refractive which should be 1.3333333 and uh yeah we've got a reflection i don't want a specular but we do want a nice ggx and no roughness and we'll just let that be shiny no specular cool and in our transparency like okay so that becomes kind of layer one we hit render right there and we're going to see the gi looks interesting by itself I'll let that render it. Cool. Now you see we've got the water and the refraction, some sunlight going. The GI is filling in a little bit of detail around the other sides. Not too much. And now that that's happening, um, actually, you know, what something, I would, something I would like to do would be to make it go deeper and deeper as it goes. So let's see if I can grab, I'm going to grab the floor, the plane. Uh, that's tough. What I should have done is had that fall off more and more. I mean, it's going to work on the shore edge, but I'd love for it to go deeper and deeper and deeper as it goes. But based on what we did here, we can go ahead and uh, it would have been nice to do some color on the land as well. But the basics would be we can go to absorption color and put in whatever kind of color that we want that this should fade into. And it doesn't take much. If we just do a little bit like that and hit render, it's probably going to be really intense. So we can't trust the GI preview, but... Let that calculate for a second, and now we go. And now you can see that it is becoming very blue and very transparent very quickly as that starts falling through. And it's going to look really cool on the edge there, but our absor absorption distance is pretty thin, so I'd probably set that bigger, like 500. And even though yeah, it's always going to be pretty intense, so you got to go like really easy on your saturation if you don't want it to be overwhelming. That seems a little better. Uh, yeah, that, that's a little bit of a muddy blue, so doing something a little brighter might be nice. And let's keep in mind that we're applying this to a very boring piece of landscape here. So why don't we go and find a quick image of sand? Although I think I do have some images. I might have an image of sand already on the computer. Give me a moment to see if I can find it. Do, 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 and put it onto the landscape. We could, and I'm, I'm, we're, we're whipping through this, so let's not uh, worry too much about that. That one should never render. And yeah, the scaling here is going to be insane. So why don't we set it to a flat projection? And 
Let's see, I never know the orientation. Yeah, we'd have to rotate that 90. Rotate this one, presumably the same 90. 90. And that's going to tile a lot, but we can scale them up. So let's go 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. That might be a little big, so let's do 333. 333, 333, Okay, we got something there now, at least. Yay, sand. Now that's going to slowly fade through. Our coral couldn't be more boring color. But you can now see, the, especially with the color, you see you get this nice fade out from one surface to the thicker material. So let's go ahead and make a material for our coral, which is not going to be much. It's going to be kind of a nice. I'm going to make it white, which might be brighter than usual. Honestly, that's pretty much all I'm going to do. I put some displacement and whatnot on it, but it's already just a random piece of geometry. Coral, coral, coral. Now, uh, you know, based on the framing and everything we were doing, we'd probably want to move this in a little bit. Yeah, I forget which render setting I'd want to do so that you don't get this GI preview. It's still rendering pretty quick for us, so that's working for me. But yeah, now we can get this little fade out as it's going further down. And um, on top of this, I'd probably have our water have some sort of bump or actual geometry. Like, it doesn't take much geometry to actually work, but we can go and put a noise in there. And we've got our... And we can use some of these simpler ones, but I gotta say, I like Naki. Naki, I think Naki has officially turned into my favorite noise. I use it for everything that's even semi-organic. I'm going to give this a decent bump. It's already got decent size. I don't know. I have no idea what the scale is here. I feel like that's probably pretty good. But I guess I won't resolve for a while. It's going to be hard to tell. But we can definitely see there's a little bit of cool refraction going on. So yeah, I like that. And changing it as it goes further in or further out would be good. But that's definitely working. Yeah, actually, I mean, the further we go with that, like, that's this little transition is pretty nice where that's transitioning into the water, fading out, going to this darker blue as it goes down. And then it just goes to how you want to control the actual water now by changing primarily the absorption distance. And so we can make that a little thicker. We can push this a little bit more into the teal color, go full brightness on the color there. That way it can only, it, it's not going to become blacker. So this one might be a, this will hopefully be a little more tropical. Wow, super tropical. We'd probably want to increase the distance because the green is becoming so overwhelming so quickly. So we make that bigger, possibly desaturate that. But also adding in the darkness makes it so that it can get darker as it goes down. Uh, changing those a little bit. I think the green will come back in a little bit. Unless that darkness, re oh, the darkness really, really pushes that to a dark place quickly. Or maybe we just need that to be more saturated. Yeah, I'm surprised how, like, the blue, the uh, teal is almost immediately going away. We're just getting left with the blue. I guess the blue, it's back now. Yeah, that's actually, that's more what I was aiming for. So, yeah, now we're going to fade to that. So, depending on how kind of tropical you want that to be, that is something. And now just adding in one more layer, a uh, little more trick on there. And that's looking, that's looking pretty good. That's about what I was hoping we'd get to. We would, um, one, I, what I'm curious about is if we do a visible light, I'm trying to think of if I've ever done this before for an underwater technique, but if we were to make our light a, let's make it a square parallel spot and there's no, no light, no illumination, but, and I've got the camera angles fine. So let's go ahead and grab this brand new light. And if I were to pull it over, we've got a square parallel light. Is it really big or what's going on here? I'm going to pull it up in the air so we can see it. Square parallel spot. Oh, I have to say it is visible. There we go. Now it's going to make it visible. And now I can say no illumination. There we go. I was, I was like, where's my box? Okay, so now what we've got is a box of light, effectively. So I, I want to see this quickly. Let's scale this to be the proper size for our scene. And we're going to do that by going to visibility and increasing, not our outer distance. 
always forget which one it is, actually. Is it this one? Oh, there we go. Uh, outer radius. So, yeah, I'm going to make that pretty big because I don't know how big our scene would ultimately be, but you can make it any size. So that's really big. And visibility is, say, 500. So now we got that. Copy, save, new file, paste it. Now we can just go take a look at this light by itself. Come on, it's huge. Okay, anyway, now if we hit render, you can see that we've got a visible light. And if I go here from the side, you should be able to see that we're falling off as we go upward. But in addition to that, we we can feed in various colors into it. So we could go and like add in a little bit of a brownish color into here. And you can see we get this brown. And uh, there's something I've always been fuzzing on. But if we make a sky object, you can see that the only thing that this light can do is make the background lighter. But... This almost never works. But if we go to visibility and we go to dust and we crank that up, then it's supposed to be able to make it darker. And I think it did, actually. Yeah, you see how this is light? It's lightening. Lightening? The background. And as we add dust in, it now has the ability to go darker than the background, which is an important detail. And now that we've got that, we can go into our noise and let's add in some visible noise and if we just render that uh, we're not gonna see much because it's really tiny so we're going to go into our visibility scale we have an illumination scale does that one have to go bigger or smaller i'm gonna go 0.1 hard to tell 111 still hard to tell yeah visibility scale is just not a reliable setting so i'm gonna go 10 times bigger manually on all the axis now we can actually see that indeed we've got this variation and I would go, and I'm not sure what kind I would do. Maybe wavy turbulence, but with the extra layers. And then we have X, Y, Z. Let's stretch it out extra far on one of the axis so we can get those kind of stretches. So the point being is, look, we get this nice little noisy, muddy imperfection. So I can copy that, and let's go back into our scene file. And we'll delete the old one, paste this one in, zero out the height, and honestly, the Z, that should be zeroed out. And let's just make sure that we are entirely under the sea. If we wanted to, let's go and make it so it's starting on the ground level there. Let's go back to our camera. And I have no idea how well or if at all this is going to show up. But let's just uh, let's see what it does. Whoa, okay, it's super there. Um, so you can see we, essentially we've created this fog underwater, which is pretty interesting. The uh, overall scale looks like we're a little too big, so I'd want to chill that out a little bit. But yeah, I didn't know if that would work or not, and it does. So I don't know, I'm just going to call that fog. I guess we can more call it the murk. Mur murky. Murky, and uh, we'd probably make it darker, and we would... Go into our noise, and it was a little big, so we're going to cut that in half, cut that in half, cut that in half, and let's increase our contrast and decrease our brightness. Something like that. So, let's see what that looks like. It's interesting, it doesn't show up at all for GI purposes. Yeah, okay, you got a little bit more murkiness going on in here. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I like these stripes and whatnot. So it's, yeah, it's another fun layer to add on top of that. So, yeah, working surprisingly well. I always, you know, doing these little underwater type things is, is super fun. What's cool about those visible lights is how quick they render. It's very fast. You don't have to spend much time on that. Um, so let's see. I'm going to go ahead. Well, I mean, obviously, this is designed to be just viewed from that little scene. Let's see what it looks like in a bigger context. And otherwise, I think we're going to call it on this one. Yeah, you can see how, you know, the dark, you know, it's going to get darker further out. We could definitely make it so that this entire thing slowly faded through the water a little bit more and then it could take longer for it to get darker and darker and darker but like this darkness i think we could represent with one of these visible lights as well so it could be through this murkiness that that happens but it could also be through a visible light so you could have it go slowly darker but then suddenly get very dark at a particular point doing a little bit of 
uh, color and specular modification on the lower parts. So it's like the weights would be hitting that. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that will cover this one. Thanks for the question. It was fun to do a little scene like that. Um, let's see, uh, MW Stan, sorry for your not so good internet. I'll see you next time. Um, do, 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 uh, Harvard saying, uh, perfect time to advertise off the record. Yeah. Off the record is the extra show that we do on Thursdays where we tackle different, uh, longer form projects. And we're doing a lot of stuff with sand. Fortunately, we ran into some limitations where the, like all the, we were trying to do all these tiny little grain particle things. And we just kept on running into limitations on how many we could do realistically. But it was pretty cool. Um, let's see. Um, Luther, is it possible to export an animation created with objects inside of a volume builder to be used in other programs such as Marvelous Designer? Um, yes, but you have to export an OBJ sequence. And I virtually never leave Cinema 4D. So... Oh, but now we've got Alembic. So I think you would just do it as a Alembic file. So let's see. We should be able to do this pretty easily by copying this nice little noise one that we made in the other scene. We're going to simplify it by making it smaller again. 200 to 200. We'll make it... Oh, you can only feed it a box. I'm going to turn it into an object shape. And it's going to be based on the object. And now the object can be a sphere. So what do we do? Put that there. Uh, subtract. Is that really what it does? <laughs> Union intersect. There we go. That's more what I wanted. Look at that. That's cool. Um, okay, that gives us our shape. Let's go ahead and give it more detail. Let's go ahead and get rid of our adaptive. Let's go ahead and thicken it up a little bit. Nice. And uh, the main question goes into... Smoothing layer still there. Cool. Um... And you know what? Let's we we can even go and put that into a null alt G. Let's go ahead and make a smoothing layer. Smoothing. I like doing these after fact. Look how nice and smooth that makes it, and it does not take very long to calculate. And then all we do is go inside of the noise and give it some animation speed. And I don't expect this to be super quick in our viewport, but as I frame forward, well, I would think we'd see animation. Let's make sure that frame is turned on. And now we go, okay, it's actually not bad. I feel safe hitting play. So you see we get this nice little animation playing. It, it seems to only be calculating something on the surface of the sphere, which is not what I was going for, but it's interesting, and I don't mind it, so we can just keep it that way. So now we've got the surface of the sphere kind of creating these interesting little blobby shapes. Yeah, that is interesting. That's where it's intersecting, but the sphere is only being created as a... Perfect primitive? Well, that's neat, but not what I wanted. Yeah, I thought that would be generating a full volume. We've run into that before. But whatever, in any case, uh, we've got that. And I think all we have to do is, it might be a good idea to put this in the connect object. So I'm going to make a connect, turn off weld, put that there. And now on the connect object, let's go ahead and save this. Um, Export mm, sequence. Um, so with that in R20 and then R19 to a lesser extent. Um, um, Sulk, uh, change distance to... Sign distance to fog, which could be the entire volume. Yeah, okay, interesting. Um, I 
guess that uh, doesn't quite make sense to me, to tell you the truth. But I guess sign distance means only seeing the actual geometry. Um, but it's cool. It's probably going to take long. I, I guess it's still fine for calculation time. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, uh, thanks for that, yeah. And, um... Okay, with that, what I want to do is right-click on it, and we have bake as a lumbic and bake as a lumbic delete. If I just say bake as a lumbic, it's going to play through our entire scene file, and it's going to be creating an alembic file so that this is no longer dependent on any of this stuff. Now, because this is animated geometry, what we're feeding it is animated, uh, the alembic has no choice but to create a sequence where it plays to frame to frame to frame to frame and captures all of the different information per frame and then when we're playing back in the limbic sequence which we will be as soon as that is done uh, apparently it instantly imported it again at this cartoonishly large scale um, but we can just change the scale to 10 and now we should be back to normal I can turn off our other hierarchy and now you see we've actually just got this limbic file importing the same shape and it's importing the entire animation so i should be able to hit play and i see we're getting real-time playback on that which is already awesome but it did it did capture all that different uh, all these different things and you can see it's actually a path to the alembic file so a an, uh, an alembic file called connect.abc so it's an alembic file got saved into an alembic folder that got created inside of our our folder here so in episode 13 it's saying inside our scene files, it made an Alembic folder. And inside here, we've now got this connect object, which is uh, almost 600 megs. So I will be deleting that. But that's 600 megs. And that Alembic file should be able to be opened in tons of things. Where Alembic is one of those universal file types where it's like OBJ, where it opens in tons of things. Uh, having said that, there is a different plugin. Let's say you want an actual OBJ sequence. There's a plugin, I think, called Riptide. Riptide OBJ sequence. Let's make sure. Object animation import sequence. Riptide Pro, is that? Yeah, okay, it is that site. So yeah, this uh, Riptide Pro is a super old plugin, but it's what everybody used for a really long time. I actually export and import uh mesh sequences so that's definitely something that uh people people used a lot so yeah it's pretty cool back to the chat and let me delete that alembic file before i forget and then i go to the zip of the scene file for patreon and it's insane and crashes everything delete that turn this back on again try again cool nice all righty back to the chat Have I, ever have I ever created a realistic soda pour into an ice-filled glass with bubbles generated? No, no, I haven't. Um, yeah, I mean, as soon as you have liquid pouring, then it's like, okay, you're going to go do a real flow simulation. You could try and push X particles to... Uh, X particles can definitely handle things at a certain scale. But if you want super realistic, you're probably starting to talk about something like real flow... And when it comes to generating, I mean, there's different rigs we could build for every step of that process, but it would be incredibly detailed and time-consuming, and especially with you having the caveat of realistic. Um, but no, I've never specifically attempted that. Like, liquid stuff is always just something I assumed I could learn if I had to, essentially opening up real flow. But the, the price and how expensive it is and whatnot always made it worse. Like, that's just not something I'm going to worry about. Uh, Rick, you have a, a baked dynamic spline. You want to do several sweeps around it. Why can't you use instances? <sighs> because baked dynamic splines are weird. They're very weird. But I can show you a workaround because I've had to deal with that a lot. So I've actually been doing a lot of stuff with this. It's uh, This one's still not quite ready, but just for fun. Um, you can see something I was working on before. I had this rendering last night, but I've been doing these uh, these animations uh, based off a, an earlier Rocket Lasso Live question. But I've been pushing some of the stuff to some new limits here. So you can see I've got these liquidy, blobby guys going around. So I'm trying to get a really nice looking one and do these really long animations. And it's actually quite a pain to be able to make it do some of what I've got it doing here. 
And uh, I, I would love to do some breakdown here or even a tutorial of some sort because I, I, I've been building some behaviors into these as well. There's almost like a little bit of AI in them so they can react to certain things. But specific to this question is you have a dynamic spline and you want to create instances of it. So let's see, what's a good example of this? Um, I guess we can just keep it simple. Actually, no. Let's do a let's do a more real worldy example. I'm not even sure if it's real world, but something uh, a, a process that we've done actually before in my own tutorials for like the guts tutorial. Uh, it's a fun process, but it's really really obtuse. So I'm going to make a tracer. It's going to trace this null. This null is going to zip around. We could use I want to use signal, but in order to keep it so it's more vanilla cinema, let's go ahead and use a vibrate tag. I'm going to enable position. Let's go. The scale is arbitrary, so I'm just going to type in two, 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 and now that should be able to go zipping around and tracing it out. And if we give ourselves enough frames, then we should be able to get uh, a pretty good snarl going here, kind of a big knot of of lines, and spline dynamics calculate really quick, so that's that's a nice detail. So. Uh, that's pretty good for our purposes. I'm going to go ahead and make that tracer editable. Don't need to worry about that anymore. And then something, I, I even remember doing these steps. I want to get a nicer spline dynamics going. And you'll actually see here, if I go into this, that there's a lot of distance in between various points. Like these are very unevenly distributed. So we, w I would want to remap this somehow so it becomes a little bit smoother. And there's two ways I can think of right now to do it. Let's make a copy so I don't mess it up. In fact, let's save it. Spline instances. Um, there's one tool in Cinema, and it's a pain to use the way it works, and it is round. So we have round, and I guess well, I guess you type in a number, but you can click and drag it interactively. But the problem is, is when I drag this interactively and actually see the point count that I want, it's it's already killed off most of the detail. So then you have to undo and then apply it again. Now I don't want a B spline. Let's make it. Oh no, B splines. Fine. Hit apply. Okay, interesting. Uh, I, it looks like we just need to type in a bunch of points here. So I'm going to say 2,222. Apply. And there we go. Uh, actually, no. It, to tell you the truth, this is uh, this was kind of an experiment. I didn't know if this would work or not. But you can see it's remapping. It's like subdividing them more. But it's if there's a big gap still, I'm trying to find visually one. But yeah, you see there's a straight line traveling here. It did not do a whole bunch of subdivisions on there. So that that is not working at all. So we have to go back to the other process that I did in that other tutorial back in the day where I'm going to remap a helix spline onto it. We might be able to use a most spline as well, but let's use a helix spline. I'm going to make a spline wrap, put the spline wrap in the helix, tell it to trace onto this object using X+. Plus. And now you can see our, our helix is getting remapped onto it. As I increase the number of points on the helix, you can see that we are actually getting a much more even distribution of points. Put that into a connect object, make that editable, delete everything else. And now you can see we've got a very evenly distributed series of points on this. Let's see, up, I'm going to select two points. I want to see approximately how far apart they are. It's like they, it looks like they're about uh, maybe 12, 15 units apart from each other. Because I want to know that because I'm going to use some dynamics. Let's right click and add some simulation soft body dynamics. I'm going to go to my dynamics tab, controller, command D, dynamics, uh, gravity, zero. No gravity, please. Let's go inside of our dynamics. A couple things I want to do. Let's go to... Follow position, yes please. Follow rotation, yes please. Uh, linear dampening, 99%. Angular dampening, 99%. So this is so it doesn't wander away. This is so it doesn't rotate to some weird position. Dampening is going to stop it from also flinging out in random directions. It's going to be a little bit smoother. It's draining out lots of energy. And let's go to... Uh, so these are going to collide with each other. But we have to give it a margin. What is the margin in which these should be able to collide with each other? So um, right now it's a margin of one, which is pretty boring. But you have to be careful not to do a larger number than the distance they are apart from each other. And let's intentionally do it wrong to show what happens. So we know that that's uh, probably about 12 units apart. They are all about 12 units apart. So let's go too far. I'm going to go 22. And let's be careful here. But I'm going to go frame forward. Actually, we won't see anything unless I'm on 
normal mode. If I go one frame forward, you're going to see, boom, it's going to suddenly explode. And that's because any given point was closer than that. So every point has to force itself away from every other point. So we have to go back to our margin and make sure that that number is smaller than our distance. So let's see if 12 is okay. Now, uh, it does look like that maybe there's a, they're still a little too close. So let's say 14. Okay, that's better. Now, I do expect a bunch of motion all over the place, but we do want this upper part to maybe be a little smoother. I'm going to go for 20, which should definitely be enough. Yeah, so now you can see it's exploding, but that's just from these intersecting each other and not from the individual spline intersecting itself. So let's go ahead and go a few frames forward, and I want to make sure they don't go too far. It does seem to be going a little nuts, but let's give it a... It's, it's playing well enough, so I think we can hit play. It does seem a little explodey still, um, to tell you the truth, um, it might be a thing where you need this number to be double. I don't remember. Let's just do that. It still explodes outward. Getting some zigzags. Uh, oh, wait. I'm increasing the number. I should be decreasing that number. What am I doing? There we go. It even fixed itself. I kept going bigger and bigger. We should have been going smaller and smaller. Why was I increasing the radius? Sorry about that. So now you can see it's now going to pop outward, but now what's happened is the dynamics have made it so they can't intersect. And visually, as a big blob here, it doesn't look like much. It's really hard to kind of tell exactly what it's doing. But if we were to make a sweep, or I guess a sweep is the quickest way. Let's make a sweep and drop these in. Didn't mean to make a copy. Drop that in, drop that in, T for scale, and scale this to 10. Then what we should see is that this is not intersecting itself anywhere anymore. You see that these should be successfully passing through. And that's if we make it the same radius that we have the rate, you know, the other. So this is about 10 now. So this should be the range in which it is not hitting any other points. But if we rewind, and you can see that it would randomly indeed be passing through and hitting other points. So there we go. We've got this nice little blobby thing. Now, we still haven't gotten to the specific question. Let's do a couple things to fix this. So you've got, you said you did some dynamics and you baked it out. What I'd love to do on this would be make something like a B spline maybe. Is that going to work with a B-spline? Is it going to explode? Oh, goodness. Okay, it's not. The B-spline must have created more additional in-between points, so I had to pause it immediately because it's going to super explode. And uh, that's because of our intermediate points. So I'm going to say natural one, so there's only one subdivision. And let's go one frame forward, two frames forward. Yeah, it's exploding quite a bit. So what we did do, just do is introduce a bunch of subdivisions after the fact, and now it's going to make it explode outward more, which is not what I wanted. So we could say none and just let it do its uh, normal thing. So those should just kind of pop out. And then if I want to smooth it out, I'd probably end up doing something like putting a subdivision surface and it's going to smooth out. And then you get these little zigzags. I'm trying to remember how to fix that. I'm not super worried about it right now, but there was, there was a way of fixing that. But anyway, we've got that. And the bigger point here being is you were running some dynamics on it and you want to make instances of it. Um... I wonder, actually, I'm a little bit curious if I'm following the question correctly. Hi, Bob. How's it going? Um, the I'm curious when you're saying instance, if you just want an instance that you can pull somewhere else or not. Now, I'm going to make a floor here so we can see something really distinct. And let's go ahead and just do a very short animation. Let's add our gravity back in again. In fact, just to make sure, I'm going to make our gravity almost double or more than double what it usually would be. And let's go ahead and bake this. So you said you baked it. So let's just say bake all. It's going to not take too long to go through there because we only have 90 frames. What's going on, everybody? Yeah, Houdini would be another option for fluids when we were talking about if you, we could be pouring soda. Uh, okay, so that's baked, so we should be able to scrub anywhere in the timeline. Oh, I put the really strong... I mean, I guess we still see it. Eh, I'll bake it again. It didn't take too long. I forgot I had this really strong uh, follow position and rotation. And even the damping... Let's go and chill that out a little. Let's go back to expert. Uh, cache, rather. Clear cache. Bake. Let that bake again. You want to do several sweeps. Uh, Rick, did you want to do several sweeps in the same spot or several sweeps in different spots, like offsetting them to different positions? Because that's all the difference in the world. 
So with this baked, hopefully this will fall. Okay, uh, Eureka is saying all in the same spot. So I think this technique will work. Ah, oh, I forgot to put dynamics on the floor. Dang it. All right, one third bake. Sorry about this. Um, clear cache. Bake. Luckily, it's a very short timeline. Do, 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 do. Yep, guts again. You can't beat guts. Oh yeah, there's a Pokemon. What's the name of that Pokemon? Where it's just a big squeal. I can't remember. Once upon a night, once upon a time, I knew all 150 of the original Pokemon. But that's kind of where it left for me, ended for me. Okay, now we got this cool noodly, squishy brain. Let's go ahead and make it uh, pop out a little bit more. I'm not going to make it pink. Um, okay, so now we got that falling on the ground. So what you're saying, you want to do several sweeps on it. So if you if we were to take this connect and make an instance of it, you're going to see that it just makes the final one. It's not working at all. So what I've actually found, let's hopefully this will work. Oh, it's going to be one frame behind, but that still might work. Um, what I've actually found to be a really good process for getting around this is actually using a tracer. If we take a tracer and I feed it that spline, and now we say it's tracing the paths, but instead of tracing paths, I'm going to say connect all elements, and we're going to pull that out, and let's feed the tracer in instead. And now you can see the tracer is actually an instance of this. Now, there's a problem with the tracer, and it's a, I might understand why it happens, but the tracer's order of operation never behaves exactly the way I expect it to. Um, Tangela, Ten Tangela, Tangela for the Pokemon name. Hmm, I'm not sure, but in any case, you can now see that I'm using a tracer object, and it is not the actual. It's not the actual object. And what's cool here is if I hit play, you see we are actually getting the animation. The problem is, is it's one frame behind. It, uh, I think actually this seems to be doing okay. Um, and now, in order to prove that this is working, let's go ahead and make this end side and hit T for scale on the end side. And then you see we get this really thin noodle. And then we're going to make an entire duplicate of this sweep. And this is always a fun thing if you've never done it. I'm going to copy that end side, go into a new file, let's paste it. I accidentally rotated it, so I can hit Shift C, PSR, zero it out. Let's make a cloner. And I'm going to put that into the cloner. And in the cloner, let's make it a radial. And let's drop it down to three. Make it a little smaller. But now that we've done this, what's cool is if we put that into a connect object, we can treat it as a single object. And we can feed that, paste it in. Now that is our spline. So we do that. And now you see we're going to get a, I'm going to turn off the original. Now you see that we're, we should be getting a triple line here. A little hard to tell, but let's go ahead and start shrinking our radius. There we go. So now you see we've actually got these three lines all traveling in parallel. And now you can see it pretty consistently. And then that that will start looking cool if we go into our sweep and I tell it to do an end rotation. I start spinning it. I'm going to have to go really high because this is traveling a really long spline. So let's add a zero on there. Okay, a zero is a little too much. Divide by two. All right, it's... Um, yeah, it depends on how much we've subdivided. But now if I were to put that inside of a subdivision surface, then now you're going to see where it gets this really nice squiggle traveling around. Turn our original one back on with a subdivision. T for scale. Scale that down. Now you can see that I've got two different shapes. Let's go and make a black color. Oops, let's go to that. Let's make a black color. Put that on our secondary line here. So now you get this cool stripey thing. So now, yeah, it's pretty cool looking. But now, uh, like I said, it might be, yeah, you see there's a little bit, it's not a frame behind. We see that in this particular instance, it's kind of lagging a little bit where if I, if I, it's still baked, so we should be able to jump around. You see, if I hit rewind, you'll see, watch up here when I hit rewind, boom, you see the spline? And then actually it stayed there, but as soon as I move my mouse around, it's going to force a refresh. So it does have that little visual refresh problem, but we now have multiple instances of that spline because we're tracing it point to point to point to point, and the tracer can handle it, where the instance object cannot. The instance is only seeing the very first frame, I think. Uh, so there you go. Was, uh, I wanted to... I, I knew that the instancing here was pretty straightforward, so I wanted to get a little bit into some of these spline dynamics. It's a pretty cool-looking shape. And, uh, yeah, now there's multiple instances of it, as long as you're in the same spot. If you didn't want the same spot, then this tracer trick doesn't work. 
uh, because I think it's going to continue traveling to wherever that final one is. And if, it, if, you, if you wanted the instances in a different spot, I think you'd have to maybe bake out to Alembic because even this tracer exists now. But if we make an instance of that, if I try and pull this instance another place, you see that doesn't move either. So yeah, there's very there's strict limitations there. And I'm pretty sure you can't clone it either. Just for the experiment, let's make a cloner. And it's set to, I'm just gonna make two clones so it doesn't go crazy. And it should pop a second copy up in the air, but you see it doesn't. So even the cloner can't handle it. Dy you know, it can't handle being fed a dynamic string like that. It doesn't know what to do with it. But the tracer does know what to do with it. So that should wrap that question up. Let's see what's next. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Everybody's doing a great job of asking typed questions. This has been, it's been fun. It's, it gives us a different vibe here. It's a, a visual thing. Hmm. <laughs> w oh yeah mw stands is working on the rocket lasso chain project if you have not uh, been checking that out make sure you go and check out in the rocket lasso slack so rocket lasso slack.com but there is a currently a chain project going on where uh, everybody is making an animation based on the rocket the Rocket Lasso Rocket, and this isn't me insisting, this is what people voted on that they wanted to do. So you can go and get the model and get some cool stuff going. So I think it's a little bit at the end, but if you if you work really hard, you might be able to go and squeeze in some time on there. Um, so, yeah, go check that out. Uh, in any case, let's go and check out the question. Uh, Eric... Uh, can you try and make an infinite breaking Veronae fracture loop where the camera follows one piece that breaks off to a larger piece that its piece breaks into smaller pieces, which exactly match the pattern of the parent fracture? Oof. Um, and then Tobias is asking a similar but completely different question, which is cell dividing clones. Man, I'd love to do cell dividing. You saw that little animation I pulled up that I'd been rendering earlier, and if I could think of a way of Maybe so those would break apart or blob into each other in a very precise way. I would love it. The problem with that kind of cell dividing in cinema is that I don't think dynamics can handle changing the number of points. If you change anything, it just resets itself. So you can't continue from that position, I think, is the problem. There might be ways around it, but it would require a bunch of code. And I'm thinking about tinkering with that, but I definitely haven't yet. And it would be code, and code is... Like, we uh, often avoid Espresso on the live stream. And code would be Espresso squared. Um, this infinite breaking Veronoi fracture loop is a tricky one. Well, first of all, you... It's not a trivial thing to break a fracture object multiple times. And I know the X particles has a new fracture, and that's supposed to be able to break multiple times. I've, I've, I've been a little questioning the way it would carry on its velocity and rotation. It just seems to generate it new. I'm not sure about that, but I haven't gotten to tinker with it. But in existing cinema fractures, it's really not super easy. I'm trying to remember. I was do, I was doing a bunch of tinkering on this. I was even trying trying to do a little bit of code as well with doing Voronoi fracture and multi breaking. Um, so the basics are just that, where it goes and it falls apart. But now imagine you wanted it to break again. So then what you start thinking is you would put it into a second Veronoi fracture, presumably. You do something like that. So you're going to fracture the fracture. So you get your existing parts, and then you break it up again. And now if we look at our sources, this is already, yeah, you can say create points per object. So now each one of these pieces should break as many times as this overall one was broken. You can see how long it's taking to do those calculations. But... Of course, the problem here is that it's already all pre-broken, and the dynamics are running on that right away. Um, so... Um, 
We, when you're doing the meteor animation a few weeks ago, we did successfully make it so we had we could break it apart in a more controlled way, but that wasn't breaking again and again and again. So, yeah, uh, as Dan is saying, yeah, X Particles Four has something you can do along those lines. Like I said, I, I feel like in the video demo I saw of it, I could see some visual limitations in what I might be able to do, but it might just been that scene file they're showing off, and I haven't gotten a chance to play with it myself where it could actually dynamically break again and again and again, which it can do that, but uh, carry on that motion um, is the part I'm interested in. Having said that, if we're in vanilla cinema, you it's either broken or it's not, and to break it again... Um... To break it again, we'd have to make something dynamic. I mean, I feel like it's... I mean, with dynamics, it's always really hard to make something kind of visually loop. You always need that fake point. So, uh, I feel like this nested thing might actually not even necessarily be the right way of thinking about it. One would be, like, uh, what is your initial shape? So, let's say, or we'll keep it simple. So, let's go ahead and, you know, pyramid. We never use pyramids. So, I'm going to make a pyramid shape. And let's say that this pyramid is going to have another pyramid that's going to be inside of it. So, we just make a second pyramid. I'm going to T for scale. Let's change it to... Um, display lines we can see inside so if we scale that in so you see we have a second pyramid inside of it and so what we would need to do is if we're going to properly break this would be let's make a bool and we're going to take the large pyramid and the small pyramid and now it's a subtract b so now you have to reverse that or a subtract b a without b well, that's kind of weird the way this is behaving. Honestly, a bool might not even be the way to do that. It might just be a connect object. But I would want to save the pyramid so that becomes like the new one. So that's like level two. This is level one. And if we are connecting, if we just make a connect object, then now we end up with those two as one model. So now we have a pyramid with this pyramid size hole in it. So now if we put that in the Voronoi fracture, there is nothing inside of that little part that's hollow. So then that makes our second pyramid here is perfectly inside of it. So when L breaks apart, you're left with that one chunk afterward, and then that's kind of it. Um, yeah, I might have need to invert the normals. Um, but if we just, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and just make that dynamic. Let's unhide our floor. And the, it, this might sort of explode, but that's potentially fine. Let's hit play. It all kind of falls apart. And where's our pyramid? Oh, there it is. So it's right here. Um, let's go ahead and tell it to have a pretty strong follow rotation. And I'm going to go ahead and make it a crazy bright color so it stands out, because even I lost it. Yeah, kind of a highlighter yellow. Should make it easy to spot that. Hit play. Boom. So our pyramid falls out. You see it going fum, 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 and it's falling to the ground. It, it seems a little small in relationship to the chunk, so let's go ahead and shrink all those up, because it's running really quick right now. Yeah, actually, this might not be as hard as I kind of made it out to be there. Because, yeah, let's see. If we if we make this, how many points do we need? Let's say 50. Um, 100. Yeah, this seems more like it. So let's see if these are all... Uh-oh, did I... Uh, our, chunk, uh, our chunk has moved out on the ground for some reason. The dynamics are... Uh, the dynamics be tripping... I must have made changes, not zero. There we go. Well, that's weird. I had to go forward and backward for it to jump back in. Let's give it a save. Six. Looping. Fracture. Yeah. Okay. So now if you play, we got smaller chunks. So now our pyramid should stand out a little bit more. Or shouldn't stand out so much because it's so tiny. Uh, I still need to follow. And for some reason, it still successfully fell over. Uh, let's go ahead and give it a lot of angular damping as well, so that it has less of a chance of rotating to a weird angle. Uh, we might need to set it up in such a way where it could survive this fall more, because you can see it's really, really resisting the correct uh, rotation. 
So, I mean, I can crank this up to something crazy. I mean, that actually dynamically kind of worked pretty well. Some stuff is exploding and cycling out and getting away. Uh, it tends to be a good idea to add a little bit of damping in overall, which tends to drain out a little bit of the energy from there. So you see they stop flipping out and bouncing all over the place. I wish I'd known that a long time ago. But there we go. This is actually working pretty well. So boom, 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 boom. Everything kind of chills out. So the thought here would be that not jumping back in the middle. It just seems to be a dynamics bug where I have to go forward and then back to get it in. Why would that be the case? It's just this couldn't be a simpler like dynamic setup. Why would that be happening? Very strange. So I think the thought for me here is, is we've got that pyramid and uh, I guess we'd probably want to bake our dynamics. So let's go and do that. Command D, expert. Oh, no, cache again. Clear cache, bake. It's only 90 frames. Should be super quick. So now we should be able to fall, see that fall and land pretty much perfectly. That is great. So now my thought is if we, re if we rewind, I'm going to copy and paste the original pyramid and I'm going to delete out the dynamics tag. And let's just pick our camera angle. So whatever, like, the original, oh, I have to become the camera. We pick our camera angle, and it's like, oh, this is, oh, you know what? If we're going to loop it, it should already be sitting on the ground. That's an important detail. So let's go ahead and pull this up. So we're pretty much perfectly sitting on the ground. It's definitely going to be a tiny little bit of a pop. If you're being more precise, you'll get it a little bit better. Uh, clear the cache, bake it again. Let's make sure it still lands properly. Yeah, ignore that other copy. Um, okay, so it's still properly landing. So now we get our proper framing. So we go, okay, here's what the animation looks like. So now we would, I'm going to make this new pyramid a child of the camera. And let's go ahead and record the position and rotation of the camera. So now when it plays through, that one's going to kind of fall and settle onto the ground in this particular position. So now my thought is if we copy and paste this pyramid... And, oh, actually, no, we don't have to do that. We're, really, what we need to do is, that's the tiny one. Oh, okay, I did it backwards. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I was close, but not quite. I needed to put the big pyramid as a child of the camera. It's a copy of the big pyramid, not the small pyramid. In order to display exactly what I'm doing, I'm going to put a display tag on it and make it line. So now I have an outline of it. So now you see when I hit play that I still have this pyramid there. So now I've got that pyramid there. At the end of the animation, I'm going to go and move my camera in such a way that this, this bigger pyramid is visually going to perfectly match exactly where that one is. Now I'm only eyeballing this. It seems to have actually worked pretty well. Yeah, actually, I think I'm pretty spot on there. And can we scale our camera down? I think so. If I put this in the camera, if I hit scale, I think the only thing that scales is its position and rotation. So I'm going to T for scale and start scaling down because I want this outer pyramid to be what's actually matching. So I'm going to move tool, R for rotate, spin it a little bit, scoot it. I'm not perfect, but you can see you can see the idea of what I did. I can pull the camera out, and now I'm going to record very carefully. Record the position and rotation there. So now, if I rewind, you see that it's perfectly matching. Well, not perfectly, but it's pretty dang close to matching this pyramid. And because everything was baked, when this explodes, my camera's going to move out, and I'm going to be right there on this final shape again. So I think the basic idea is, and this might actually work surprisingly well. Yeah, this might be cool. Um, oh, no, Eric, did I start answering Eric's question? He wasn't even in the room. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you're still following. But yeah, I just booled out the original shape from inside of it. So it's just one of the chunks. And then it's zoom, we're using the reference of the original shape to zoom in on it again for the second one. And now my thought is, is if we can make a copy, um, is it safe to duplicate that? It's baked. If they're both baked, I think, no. Ooh. Okay, let's see if I can get this to work. I mean, um, I'm going to save if they make that editable. Nope, undo. Fast forward, make it editable. There we go. Now we've got all those chunks. I don't even care about that. I'm going to put in a connect object, make it editable. Copy that, undo, 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 undo. 
Undo, undo, undo. Okay, cool. We're back to that. And now we can rewind. Make sure it's still working. Cool. And now the idea is uh, doing the reverse process so that I want to scale those chunks up. Yeah, I think this will work really well, actually. Um, we need to do the reverse process. So um, let's paste in that final. This is where all those pieces will eventually break to. But we're going to have to scale those up to be in the same position. So let's go ahead and whoa, let's remove the dynamic tag from that thing. All right, um, those should be being ignored. Now, if we go and we fast forward to the end, then we have all these final chunks in that final position. That bake is, oh, did it lose the bake? Okay, well, it seems to have lost the bake, but that's why I saved it. So let's copy that and say revert to saved. And now it is baked again. I thought that might happen, which is why I saved it. And if I hit paste and unhide, yeah, okay, it is perfectly matching. Cool. Hopefully, didn't learn anything out. Um, so, uh, yeah, you could, you could Voronoi, you could, uh, Alembic bake Voronoi, but we don't need it for this. So we need to do the same way I got the camera position to match from one to the other. We need to do the exact same idea here. So what I'm going to do is, um, um, we need a, I, I kind of wrap my brain around this. I think we need a copy of this pyramid in its current position. And I think that, is this the current position? No, but I think I should be able to make it a child. Or not. It's all still zeroed out. Was this one properly met? You remove? No, it's up in the air. Why is that not? This pyramid is... Actually, look at that. That's, this is... Am I, am I losing my mind here? Why... Look at this. If I click on this pyramid, which you can see visually is actually down here on the ground, unless it's um, that's a copy I just made. Everything else is hidden. So visually, we can see a pyramid right there. I can select it. And it says it's at 0, 0, 0, 0 rotation. And that is not true. So why, so why is it uh, making the claim that it's at 0, 0, 0? I mean, unless being baked does that. It's a little bit of a pain. Um, Um, that just makes it one step harder because now, essentially, I'm trying to think of any way around it. Connect object. Nope, that made it forget. Pain in the butt. And now it's dead. So, which is fine. That's why we still have it saved. Um, so yeah, I mean, unfortunately, like I said, it's being a little bit of a pain here. Uh, the only thing we can do is try and match it up again. So, uh, what, I, this other one seems to be, uh, the, the one I already match moved. So that's already actually doing a good job for us. We can just take that one. So I think what I want to do is put the Voronoi fracture that we have inside of the pyramid that we have into the camera and now I want to rewind and everything's way all over the place um, but we need to do is our camera is matching that is it is that that's not all we need to do because now we're way up in the air with it aren't we Whew. sorry my uh Yeah, so those are all floated up into the air, but our pyramid, oh yeah, and there's our little pyramid, so we need to scale it, yes, 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 okay, 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 I think we're good, we're, uh, what we need to do is a T for scale, and scale the camera until, yeah, we're going to scale the camera until that pyramid is reprojected back in that same spot. And now that brought along all the rubble for the ride. So now we can pull that out. We still have this other pyramid just for reference because it already came in handy once. And now we can go to the POV of the camera. And now you can see that when we start out our animation, we're amid all of this rubble. And now when we hit play for the animation, it's going to explode in all these dynamics. And then it's going to fall. <laughs> the only problem being we have a giant rock in the way. Um, so that's a problem that I can't get around easily. 
Dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it. How do we get around that limitation? Um, I mean, it's probably a prominent piece as well. The only thing I could think of is, you know, I'm going to select it, split it off, delete it, uh, hide the copy, so now that's not there anymore. And then when this happens, we need to see what the offending chunk is, and it's this one, and we need to just hide it. Uh, I can't think of any way around it. Let's add a... And we'd have to re-simulate until we had one where it's not in the way. But we'd have to kind of do everything we just did again. I'm not going to do that. So I'm just going to select that one. And now we're going to add a MoGraph. I guess just a plane effector. Plane effector. Hopefully, I mean, it's baked. So I'm hoping this isn't going to stop us from doing something to it. It does sort of seem to be. Scale, uniform scale, negative one. Dang it. Yeah, it's not going to let us do it because it's baked. So, um, what's the easiest way to stop that from happening? I don't want to worry about it. The, the problem is that the whole concept is here, except for that one little chunk. The idea should be, yeah, well, okay. I, I can't think of any way around this except for ignoring it. Uh, no, well, here's the thing is we can't. We can't just change the camera angle because we'd have to match it on both sides again. So I'm just going to, let's just, we'll have to use our imaginations here as if we did a simulation slightly differently. Because uh, I just want to go through that whole process of scaling again. But the point being is if I go and I turn off our colorized fragments, I guess we'll just put a new material on everything. So we need it on there and we need it on there and probably there. So with everything having the same colorized fragments, if I hit play, then that should explode out, and we zoom up, and we see that chunk, and then it's going to explode again, and zoom in again, and it's going to explode again, and zoom in again. And so you just see this one chunk was kind of in the way of our camera, but if we had if we had set up a different angle, it would be working really well. Um, it looks like my floor is just slightly needs to be moved up a little. Actually, it's not even true necessarily, but... Um, Oh, there's different, there's definitely, there's a, Hadley, there's a bunch of different ways we could potentially move pieces if we were to bake it. If I had made this editable, if I had done the Veronic Fracture and made that editable and rendered the, dy the dynamics and the individual chunks, and we could just do it straight without the Alembic. Um, but I, I already have a cache simulation, and that simulation is making it so this pyramid will happen to land where it did, and to change that would be to change all of the camera angles. So this isn't about that there's not ways of fixing it. It's just that we'd have to manually fix a camera again, no matter what we did. Uh, I, I guess what you're saying right now is if I if I do an alembic bake, I think you're saying if I do an alembic bake right now, then I might be able to remove that chunk. So well, why not give it a quick try? Um, say bake is alembic. It should be pretty quick. And we'll hide that. And um, doesn't it's doing something weird so you know i'm not, I'm not going to pursue that right now it doesn't seem to be quite cooperating but outside of this little chunk here and there's other ways we could probably make it disappear but you can see visually that every other chunk is matching the floor is just a little like i said we didn't calibrate the floor perfectly but yeah now we have a, an infinite breaking looping animation which conceptually is pretty fun. I hadn't ever thought about how I might go about doing something like this. Yeah, it's pretty entertaining. So it's all about making the beginning camera move match at the end and then making the final state of the rubble match at the beginning. And that's really the entire process. And then the rest of it just kind of comes along for free. And then, you, yeah, it's pretty trippy because it's like, oh, we're zooming in and then in again and then in again as long as everything stopped moving. I mean, we do have that one rogue chunk. We get this one little guy flipping around. If we had spent more time, made sure, okay, do we really like the simulation, then then that would have been a good idea. But overall, I think we, I, I'm quite happy with, with where we ended up. Like the, the concept is right there and it's not something I've ever specifically tried to do before. So that was pretty neat. Um, it's pretty trippy. Yeah, I kind of like the cracked egg. I'm just kind of enjoying watching it explode.
explode. Yeah, and then I guess we did see even if we did quick shading. Yeah, no lines. So yeah, that, it's going to seem like it even more now. Is that just dang one chunk? <laughs> oh yeah, it does seem like that one little piece is flying in, going tink, and then making it explode. Uh, yeah, I like it. Uh, I think we should be able to... Oh yeah, we could make the camera linear. So we just uh, select all the keyframes and say linear. And then we probably want to remove one frame at the end or um, make this animation one frame less. Explode. Explode. Oh, maybe... Uh, Do we need that frame? Or, yeah, I still feel like a tiny little hiccup there. I'm going to get rid of two frames. Oh, interesting. It does feel like there's a little something else. The camera doesn't feel completely fluid. And I'm trying to think of what would make that happen. If only we could make this little level of nested uh, dynamics happen for real. It's pretty cool, though. I like it. Yeah, I'll, I'll try a more detailed version of that sometime. Might be fun to do. Uh, okay, let's do one more question for sure. So go and type out the last one. Uh, I want to take a quick opportunity to do a super short pitch for the Patreon setup. So I want to jump on over here and be like, hey, uh, I super enjoy doing these live streams. It's really fun. It's really fun to try and tackle things I don't understand how to do and communicate with people and see all the community helping each other, helping me answer the questions. And, and it shows me cool motion graphics pieces and hopefully other people that they wouldn't have seen it otherwise. I love... Uh, I love linking to and making sure that the artists get credit on everything. Um, if you uh, and then I use some of these as inspiration to make tutorials in the future, so bigger tutorials uh, is the plan. Now I'm able to more I'm able to do that more and consistently do these live streams by getting help from pa uh, all of you helping on Patreon. I've got a Patreon set up. If you're on Twitch, then there's a link just below the screen of some some place you can go and grab. Uh, the link to Patreon. There's a really low level for students if you want to just support and you think this stuff is cool and you've been learning stuff from me. And it goes all up to some crazy high levels. If you're like a big studio and somehow something I did saved your butt and it you know, won you the bid and whatnot and you want to really support the stuff I'm doing, there's great. That's great. But there's... Um, there are bonus live streams if you're at the $10 level. If you're at the $20 level, then you get all the scene files. Every time you see me save one of these scene files, it all gets packaged up. And usually on Thursday, the day after the show, I am able to post those online. And you get all the scene files. You can deconstruct them yourself. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click on... I actually set the animation up here. So I'm going to let this play. And then we'll do the last question here. <laughs> Yeah, it was a fun little animation. I liked making that. But anyway, let's get back to the stream and get some questions. <laughs> uh, Lucas had a question somewhere. I think Lucas had to wander away, but let's check it out. <laughs> Coastline. Yeah, does someone have that uh, crossfader question? I'm not sure. Where, oh, there, I might have found it. Uh, could you build a pinball machine, but the ball is rolling around on a floor that has springs under it that dynamically respond to the weight of the ball? Could you build a pinball machine, but the ball is rolling on a floor that has springs under it that dynamically respond to the weight of the ball? Um, I guess I don't think Crossfader is actually here right now. Or you are here. Um, oh, wait, no, that, I didn't scroll all the way back down here. So I think Crossfader had to wander away. 
come on, go to the bottom of the chat. Do, do, do. Oh, you are here. Okay, so I have a clarification question. Um, when you say it respond like it responds to the weight, do you mean there's a whole bunch of like little tiles that have springs that would bounce back and forth on it, or do you mean that there's like it's like a trigger where the ball will roll over it and it, the floor panel acknowledges it some way, so you have it as a way of triggering espresso or something along those lines would be the the distinguishing question I would need for that. <laughs> Just the floor moves down. Uh, well, once again, for clarification, do you mean that, like, it, is it like a floor, it's almost like a, a, be, a box spring on a bed where it, like, has the little, or the, the actual mattress where there's a little, like a series of little panels that are, like, wiggling around, or that it would suddenly fall away and become like a pit. Um... Like a mattress. I mean, ugh, okay, I'm not... Uh, that becomes a really potentially fiddly proposition. Um, because... Um, because of the way that they're moving... I feel like there's a push and pull there that might be, you might picture it artistically, but it's going to fight you. So let's do a quick test. Honestly, like I wouldn't even want to build it kind of with springs. Like I wouldn't want to build it for real. I'd want to fake it. So let's go ahead and make a tile. So let's just say this is a tile and let's go ahead and make a cloner. And I'm going to put this into the cloner and let's go ahead and make a grid. And let's go ahead and set that to one. I think we can go like, let's say eight by eight. And I'm not sure how much distance they need. And we need a little bit of space between them so they can wiggle. So 370 seems like a pretty good number. Okay, that's fine. And so let's go ahead and make our pinball. I kind of like to leave it default scale, but I made those a little small. Let's make that 50%. And honestly, we need those bigger. So I'm just going to hit T for scale. Scale this up to exactly 200. So we still have pretty clean numbers. All right, so if we were to move this ball up into the air... Not too far, because I don't want the fall to heavily affect what's going on. And let's make a cube, T for scale. This is going to be our trap box, so nothing can escape it. Let's go ahead and make it a display tag object. So we'll add a display tag and make that invisible. And now we're going to make that a simulation collider box, which has a static mesh on it and then and then we're going to put both the sphere and our tiles let's go ahead and rename this one tiles we're going to add a regular simulation oops simulation rigid body and then on these tiles i'm going to go ahead and just give it a really strong force and rotation and that's really all I'm going to do is to start out with. Okay, so right away you see this is going to go floop and fall right through. Okay, that's too much. Let's give it some linear damping. That should help a decent amount. It's going to slow those down, depending on how springy we want them to be. That will definitely make them not springy. Uh, okay, it needs more follow rotation. Okay, so now you can see it's enough at least to hold it there. Now I'm going to make, uh, let's make the tiles not follow position chill that out a little bit and let's make the tiles under forces i'm going to say these should include things which means it's going to ignore when i right now make a simulation particle wind oh no i didn't want wind uh, particle turbulence and we're going to give it some scale and we're going to make it pretty high and now hopefully the idea would be well, yeah, yeah, you see, the idea would be that our pinball can start rolling around. Let's make the pinball lighter, because right now it's a little heavy. Mass, I'm going to give it a custom density of 0.25, so it should be a lot lighter. And now I'm going to keep on increasing the turbulence three times as strong. I think will probably be enough. So there we go. Now you can see that we, this is rolling around, and the turbulence is pushing it around. And 
like that's working pretty well. And you can see we get kind of got this nice springy floor, which is reacting to what it's doing. So we didn't actually have to set up like some complex spring operation. We could just be like, okay, here are the properties of what this can do. And now it's kind of free to go and roll around in the surface and react as, as it wants to on it. Now, uh, having said a lot of that, it goes to, it goes to like the goal becomes really specific. Right. No, right. Okay. Yeah. And so you're saying like, let's say that this was happening, I mean, but it also goes to like, you're saying, um, push them down. So it seems like you want them to be, uh, more only moving up and down and not so much rotation. So let's see if we can make it do that a little bit. And let's worry about the springs in a second, if that's even a thing we can do. And I'm not entirely sure it is, but we'll find out. Um, let's go to our forces and I'm going to, we essentially want to lock off this rotation like we, we don't want it to rotate very much i'm going to really drain the energy out from rotation and let's give it a 55 on that so like they're really n like trying not to rotate too much and we need to and that see this is this is kind of where i was getting to where there's it's going to become really fiddly on the settings for how this is going to go because by putting less follow position on here you see that these are all naturally their natural state is to sink pretty far down so if I go and put it up to a two, then okay, now this is successfully rolling around, but the uh, it's definitely fiddly. Let's see. First of all, they don't seem to be wanting to get back up to their original position very much, which is interesting. Uh, let's go ahead and make sure that they don't turn off dynamically. Dynamics deactivation zero zero because they might have slowed way down see so yeah, well this is interesting where it seems to be knocking them further down and they're not going back up again why would that be the case because we're telling it to go back to it's just a follow position which means they should be constantly trying to get back to their original position this isn't sucking the energy out um JM, you're probably right if we're going to build a more of a rig to fake it. I was trying to do it more with real dynamics to actually let this happen, but like this behavior here is very bizarre. Like, why aren't these returning? I, I, I'm just kind of really confused why these are not returning to their original position. strange hmm I don't think it's a bug but uh, having said that well the um, JM is right where building this with fields might be a better option um The trick comes into, you have a rig and you want it to behave in a certain way. I guess you'd have to blend between two object states. I guess that makes sense. So yeah, let's try doing a completely, I, I guess almost completely unrelated rig. Um, this one didn't go too far. I don't, I'm just gonna go off here. I don't think there's anything useful in the scene file. So they're not gonna be dynamic at all, at least not properly like that so the thought would be here's our tile let's make a helix and a end side and a sweep and we'll put those in change our orientation and we'll do t for scale scale our spring down and that's bizarre What? <laughs> Visually, that was, that was strange. Times four. Okay, now we got a bunch of springy bits, and I'm going to go ahead and change the height 
And then we got a nice little cartoony spring, T for scale, scale the entire thing down. And I'm just going to go and go boink and stick that in the bottom there. Let's go ahead and make a nice metallic material. Why not? Remove, add, Beckman, shiny spring. We'll add a little bit of blur on there because it's for free in the viewport. And we've got our tile. Why not make it a little bit prettier? Put a fill on there. One, one. There we go. Just a little little something to make it stand out. And if you're going to make a tile, you got to have a nice white tile. Pink. Cool. Okay. So that becomes a tile. And it becomes a rig the instant that we put into a null. So let's make a null. And... Let's make the null go down to the base. I'm going to go down 200 units. Let's go ahead and put the spring in. Let's go ahead and put the tile in. I'm just going to call it tile rig. Yeah, I don't think I think that's kind of all we need. Um, although, oh, the null's up there. The null, you know what? The second thought, I don't know this for sure, but I'm going to move the null up here. Might even need to go higher than that, but let's just put it up there. So let's go ahead and put that into a cloner. But we also need a second version of the rig. So let's turn off the cloner. And the second version of the rig is going to... Let's make sure axis is turned off. The second version of the rig is going to make it so that the helix is way shorter. So we're going to compress it way down. And we're going to grab our tile and we're going to pull it down so it kind of visually looks like it's still in the equivalent spot. There might be some intersection, but it's good enough for me. Uh, so those become our two rigs. Uh, a couple of properties have changed, which means if we put these both into the cloner... Turn on the cloner, and let's set our cloner to linear, just for a moment. We'll set the cloner to linear. We'll have it travel off to the side. Then you're going to see that what we should get, if this is working, we should be able to set this cloner mode to blend, and you should be able to see as I make more clones that we should just get in between steps, where you see it's, we're actually just transitioning from one state to the other. So that's our spring rig. So um, now we can put this back into a grid. And let me remember this part, because this is going to be the tricky part. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Cubic, spring, transform, weight. Is it the weight? No. Uh, what's the distribution on these? What parameter do we drive? to do the transition. So let's do a plane effector. And I'm going to go modify clone. Yes, okay, modify clone. So modify clone is going to be our magic parameter here. So if I modify the clone to be not position, but only modify clone, everything's been pushed to its upper state. Cool. And now if we add, uh, let's just say upper. Now we'll grab our cloner. And let's make a second plane effector. And the hope here is that we can uh, modify the clone to its earlier state. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's very interesting. So if we say modify clone to 1%, it's now entirely in that lower state. So that's interesting. But uh, the main question is if we were to make a linear field on this, and already visually that doesn't seem to be working, that's not transitioning. Um, goodbye. That's all in the upper state, so can we instead... What am I missing here? Dan is asking... Wouldn't you use an inherent effector? Would we? I would just want to morph between two objects. Uh, the in My brain is barely wrapping around this as it is right now, uh, after two hours of streaming and talking, and it is not bringing me the answers super easily. So I'm not going to worry about the inherent workflow, if that's a thing at all, which it might be. But this is super strange. So if that's set to 1, we can't control a modified clone with a fall off. So it would only be setting this. It's very strange to me that the modify clone is 
at zero is does nothing and then suddenly if we push at anything above zero it's at below amount that's very strange but once again i think if we put a linear fall off you see it's actually not doing anything this is not transitioning between those shapes i have done this before i have done it where oh actually maybe i did that with i did it with keyframes i did it with keyframes instead of blends but i still think you can do it with a blend what am i doing wrong here no 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 instances Uh, Dan, if you have a scene file example you'd want to put together, then we can check it out. But like right now, I'm not. I'm not going to switch to uh, an an inherent an inherent effector workflow because that is not where my brain is at on this. Um, now, this blend mode, I'm almost certain there's a way of doing it with a blend mode, but since it's not immediately cooperating, I'm I'm even a little skeptical of what's happening here because. Look, I, I deleted. Um, I just deleted the other one. There is no plane effect. There's nothing, and now we're still seeing a blending of a clone. So it's a little buggy. Um, but uh, in any case, um, I was thinking that maybe we do the the morphing, the blend mode would be working well. But instead of that, I think we can do a keyframe thing, which is almost the same concept. So pretty much, we're gonna keyframe this. The two parameters that we need which is going to be the height of the tiles we'll go to y and then i'm going to grab the spring the helix rather and we're going to record the height and now uh honestly we don't we only i'm going to jump up like 10 keyframes we don't need to go far 10 keyframes forward and now let's go ahead and give it a give the spring Ooh, come on you can do it i didn't think i had there were that many clones it's being a little fiddly one twenty two and okay we need to keyframe that and let's go to our tiles and pull that up into the air and once again i'm just going to kind of eyeball that cool so now we've got something that is going to be keyframed and i need to keyframe the y height and it'd probably be a good idea to grab those keyframes and set them to linear all right cool so now these are keyframed instead of blending and if we go into our cloner, this is very important, there is a setting in the cloner under transform, which is animation mode play, but we can say fixed. And by saying fixed, it means it's going to stay at the beginning of the animation forever. And no matter where we are in the timeline, it's just going to stay there. Now, what's cool about that is if we make a MoGraph plane effector, now I'm going to say main MoGraph plane effector, don't push uh, the position, but I do want to do a time offset of 10 frames. So now you can see that the entire animation has offset 10 frames forward. Uh, this is still running really slow, so I'm going to dramatically reduce our poly count on the setting here. That's already way down. Let's grab this. Uh, none. How many, how low can we go on that? 20? No, I guess 25 is a little we can go. That should already help a decent amount. All right. Um, so anyway, the plane effector is doing a time offset of 10. And now I pretty much guarantee if I make a linear effector that, yes, it is actually now transitioning from one to the other. So let's go into the linear field and do a spherical fall off, spherical field. And now uh, I guess what we need this to do is the inverse of what it's doing. So let's say invert. And now anywhere the sphere is, it's going to be pushing those down instead so now those aren't dynamic at all so i could make a floor i probably want to make that bigger as well let's make the sphere up to a thousand let's go and make it shiny and i wish i hadn't deleted that bounding box i had made before but i did so unfortunately i just have to make it again t for scale and dynamic collider so simulation collider body Static mesh and display tag. Mm, mm, mm. Cool. So that's just a box that's trapped in. And I got rid of the turbulence too. I should have kept all, uh, all the elements. I was like, oh, we don't need those anymore. We actually did need. So I need the turbulence again. And the turbulence needs to be pretty strong. It has to have some scale. And we need a dynamic floor. And we need the sphere to be dynamic again. Cool. So we say all of those things. Now, I'm, I don't look at how slow this cloner is. 
Like, is this that complicated of a rig? It's not dynamic or anything. Yeah, turn. I'm doing everything I can to make this run a little bit faster. Well, turning off those caps seem to help a little bit. Uh, okay, so now we get this floor, and the floor is dynamic, and it's a collider body. So the idea would be is that this the ball can roll on the floor, which will be invisible. And the dynamic's going to make it bounce around. So let's see. that. Yeah, this ball will roll around doing its own thing. But now we can put the spherical field into wherever the ball goes. And we probably have to increase that radius right around there. I'm not sure exactly what this would have to be. So we have to, be, we have to go carefully on this. But let's see what we get right now. So yeah, okay, that's not bad, actually. Uh, it's running slow. It's not that slow, but I'm going to speed up for our viewport viewport purposes. I'm going to speed up the turbulence, so this is going to roll. And there we go. Now you can see that we actually do get the springs. Also, I'm using a turbulence. I shouldn't be using a turbulence because that also pushes up in the air, so you can see it's occasionally flinging the ball up into the air. I should be using a randomly rotating wind. But, yeah, okay, it shouldn't be. Damn you, turbulence. Uh, wind, boom. Okay, random wind. Um, Cinema 4D, vibrate tag, rotation, rotation of 7,000 200 at speed of 0 .001. 0 0.001. Okay, now that's spinning and randomly rotating, and as it spins, the wind should make the sphere roll, and now it's not going to be shooting up into the air. So uh, at this point, it would just be, actually, it's, considering I was just guessing, it's actually doing a really good job of the spherical fall-off kind of colliding with the pieces near it. And we probably want to make that spherical fall off a little bigger. Not too much, just enough so it kind of looks like these, this isn't colliding with it too much. Our wind isn't spinning fast enough. Ten times as fast with you. Oh, that's too much now. Maybe. Yeah, too much. You have to build an AI ring for that to control well. So that's going to spin. That's going to make the sphere automatically go in its own direction. So, yeah, that's going to bounce, and you see it's pushing them down. That's all working well. Um... And then we can go into our plane fall off and probably add in, we got the spherical fall off, but we can do some, some different delays and decays if we wanted to. The obvious one would be put some springiness into it uh, and turn off clamp. Although um, they can't go above where they are. So something that's interesting here is something I'd probably do, I don't even know if this will work, but I would probably multiply, let's see, multiply by black is going to force them all in the low state. So what I would do is multiply like a little bit so that they're not in their top state. And that way they actually have someplace upward they can travel a little bit. So essentially we're saying like, oh, you're not at your peak state. So they can actually go lower. And now that means it can actually overshoot and go higher a little bit by whatever amount that we set this already kind of pre-sprung a little. And now these can roll around and it can push it down and each of those will travel down and wiggle. Um, there are some things we'd have to do where, like, right now, the wiggle, this uh, springiness is going to be on the downward part and the upward part. We'd have to do things on the rig to make it additive somehow so that it only is springy up near the peak. I'm not sure how I would do that. Possibly masking it off with a lower. I don't. I've never even tried that. I don't think this will work. But when I don't think something will work, I try it anyway, so we can find out if it if I was wrong. Seven A. Do 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 do. Seven A. Springy tiles form. Do, 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 do. Okay, uh, oh, uh, yeah, so my thought was, is inside of our plane effector, if we add a linear field, and the linear field I set to Z plus, uh, I don't know, not Z plus, Y plus, 
and let's make it really thin. So we'll go like 20. So now this is, shouldn't be doing much. In fact, if I set it to normal, yeah, you see this is actually just going to force everything up and down. Now, what I'm think, what I was thinking is if we made a folder and we put the delay inside of the folder and I don't know if this is the case, but if I were to multiply the spring, like it can only happen on one side or the other. And I just have no idea if that's a thing. Like we've made one a child. So uh, some stuff might be wrong, but I just want to see is if we get some springiness on like the top, but not the bottom. Visually very difficult to tell. I don't think that worked. Very visually difficult to tell. Hmm. <laughs> I would like the springiness to only be on one side. But nothing is immediately coming to mind to make that indeed be the case. Because it would only go down, I mean, logically, it would only go down when the sphere pushes it down. It would only spring when it's kind of free to be springy on the other side. Yeah, um, I don't know. I think that's as far as I'm going to go on it. I think the concept is there. And Dan, if you end up uh, doing some inheritance version of it, I'd be super curious about what you were thinking there because nothing is clicking right away in my brain for the way that might work. But I would be curious if there was a method. Um, could we multiply the springiness with a linear field? Isn't that what we just did? I, uh, MoGraph, I think that's literally what I just did. Um, I, I put in a folder, multiplied it by a linear field that was only above a certain point, and then it didn't visually seem to do anything. And then we have the decay effect, and then there's even just ways of like these getting applied. Like if I applied it additively, um, It is kind of, it is visually cool. Yeah, we made a couple cool things today. I like it. Um, I do think I'm going to wrap up, though. Um... Because, yeah, I mean, the reality here goes is I could totally see, like, uh, the way, it, there's always, like, these different sta steps, these different, uh, how would you say it, these different levels that we could do inside of Cinema 4D. And one is, like, try and build something really, like, as real as we can, which would be, like, oh, build a dynamics rig that is actually kind of holding in place. But then I don't, I wasn't sure where I was going to go with actually trying to attach a spring to it. And then we have kind of this MoGraph type setup where it's like, okay, well, we're kind of faking it with fall-offs and effectors, and now we have some springiness and some decay and different things we can layer up, and there's probably a lot we can do. And then you got your final really detailed level, and that's when you properly build a rig where we would take a single spring platform and a single tile and potentially have it be driven via dynamics, but have entire like almost like a little AI or entire rig where it's like, oh, if, if it comes in range, it can now lower here. And then once that is lowered, it triggers a new event that once the ball is clear, it can now travel back upward again. And when it's traveling upward, the spring effect is in effect. And then that's a single tile rig. And now you would probably clone it and make the, edit, the cloner editable. And now each of them is its own kind of intelligence that can do that. Uh, while everything's in a cloner, they're all instances of the same thing. And they can't do all those little individual commands they'd all be doing the exact same thing at the same time so it just goes to what version of that rig you can do at any given point which can become challenging which one you should approach with it i mean it ends up being when i'm doing a, a 
a real, when I'm doing like a, a paid job here, I'm doing something final, oftentimes I would almost immediately go for that more complex final rig because you're ultimately going to get the most control over that. As long as you're very careful and methodical with the way you build it, then it's the kind of thing where it's like, yes, like you put into a cloner so you get a whole grid of them, but you always keep that copy of it. So whenever you have to make changes, you're making them to the master copy and then remaking the cloner editable. And I wish, I wish that there was a step where we didn't have to make the cloner editable, but that is just the way it is. Like, on a very base programming level, it's the way that has to be. So, yeah, that ends up being the challenge on that part of which you go for. But building the big, final, complex rig can... Well, is definitely the most, cons the most time-consuming part of it. So it's the most difficult to make during a live stream. And the, uh, I mean, even those little blobs, I'll pull them up again. The blobs I've got here, the uh, the little AI I started building into them. It's like, you know, I could just put all of these into a cloner and make a whole bunch of little blobs. But then if they're supposed to have different dynamic properties, depending on how many subdivisions that they have, and then if they're supposed to have different stiffnesses, depending on how much they got squished, all this stuff immediately goes to, like, they each have to be their own standalone cop instance of an entire rig. So there's a whole bunch of different properties inside of one setup, and then each becomes a copy of the last one, not an instance of the last one. So that kind of stuff can become uh, fairly complex fairly quickly. And, uh, and even something like this, I've spent a, a decent amount of time like building the rig up. So this is, you know, this is days of work putting it together. So the idea of doing those kind of things during a live stream becomes a little dangerous. Um, but in any case, I am feeling good about today. It was kind of fun. What do you guys think about this experiment with uh, asking questions, like typing out the questions? I don't want to do it regularly. I like people being able to do links. And usually we're getting a pretty healthy mix of both. But I thought force people to stretch their imagination a little bit and come up with typed questions. And I will say it was definitely a, a different flavor of types of things that we might tackle when you can't just be like, oh, how do you make this? So it's like, oh, how would you make... And everybody did a really good job of asking the questions. So it was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, I'm not going to ramble anymore. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming and hanging out. The questions were great. It was really fun. And I'll see some of you for the bonus stream tomorrow. And I'll see more people on the MoGraph podcast that I'm going to be on on Monday. And then I'll see everybody else on Wednesday and on the Slack channel. Make sure you go and join the Slack channel, which is uh, the temporary URL right now is at www.rocketlasso.slack, all one word, dot com. Um, and that should do it. Uh, Crossfader put a link in the chat there, so that should wrap this up. Make sure you go and check out the Chain Project, and uh, I think, uh, did the um, did the modeling challenge wrap up already? That one was really cool, building spaceships out of the uh, mechanical parts. That was really neat. Um, I, I haven't checked if that one, when, when that one's wrapping up. But in any case, bye-bye, everybody. I will see you next time. Toodaloo. <laughs>